Denny Nagel, a two-time All-Star and World Series champion, pitched for 13 seasons in Major League Baseball. He broke in with the Minnesota Twins on July 27 during their 1991 championship run and would join the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1992, the year they clinched the National League East title. He would spend four and a half seasons in Pittsburgh, a stint that included his first All-Star selection in 1995 before getting traded to the Atlanta Braves late in the summer of 1996. Nagel joined a juggernaut pitching staff that was anchored by future Hall of Famers Greg Maddox, Tom Glavin, and John Smoltz. The next season, Nagel would make his second All-Star team and lead the National League with 20 victories, finishing third in the Cy Young Award voting. In 1998, he would be part of a starting rotation considered by many to be the best ever. Nagel, along with Maddox, Glavin, Smoltz, and Kevin Millwood, each won at least 16 games that season. The 98 Braves became the first team with five pitchers to do that since the 1923 New York Yankees. In 2000, after a season and a half with the Cincinnati Reds, Nagel found himself a member of the Yankees who, like the Braves, were in the process of building their own dynasty. The Yankees would beat the crosstown rival Mets in the World Series that year with Nagel the starter in Game 4. He would spend the remainder of his career out west with the Colorado Rockies playing in his final game on July 20, 2003. Now, nearly 20 years after throwing his last pitch in a major league uniform, Denny Nagel joins me on Touching Base. Thanks so much for doing this. I know you're busy and and you hey, know, no problem, man. My you're pleasure. A coach now, so thanks again. And before we talk about you, I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, your son, and he's he's uh, he's continuing the legacy of baseball. And uh, last week, you guys had one heck of a trip in Arizona. You're the pitching coach uh, for his uh, varsity team. And uh, is it true that two no hitters were thrown? <laughs> yeah, but I, I'd love to be able to say it was their awesome pitching coach that had so much to do with that. But man, it was all these guys, man. They they went out there and they really performed and. Unfortunately, too, Michael, I have to tell you, though, too, or Mike, um, that my son is actually not even he's not even able to play his senior year. He had a small tear in his in his UCL, the Tommy John ligament. Oh. And they did they did that PRP injection, which is the new thing now where they take your blood out, spin it yeah. and, and inject it back with the good platelets and stuff. We thought it was going to work. But the more he kept getting ready for the season to start, I could see him just battling his release point and trying to, you know, it's that thing that you recognize as a pitcher. And I kept seeing him and. He kept struggling with it to the point where he was almost in tears with it, you know, and I was super proud of him though, Mike, because he came to me finally the one day and he was like, dad, my, my arm's just killing me, man. I just can't do it. And he goes, you know, I, I, I'd love to be able to say that I can, you know, stick around and maybe help the team out. But he goes, to be honest with you, dad, I don't want to take a roster spot of some kid that maybe is more deserving. And just because I'm Danny Nagel's son, the pitching coach's son and everything. And so I was pretty proud of him that, you know, he was mature enough to admit that, you know, and not wanting to take a spot for another kid. So He's been uh, he's been helping out and he's been covering the team with um, some live broadcasts and live streaming and stuff, whatever, for the school website and stuff. So he's he's having a blast with that. So he's doing his part and he's being a team player and, you know, he's not being he's being selfless, which is which is great. It's a great work ethic to uh, to have in addition to being able to uh, perform on the field when he can. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, we, we, I was super proud of the boys. Though. You know, Chase came on the trip to Arizona trip because it was a two full trip because he was there to, to support the team, like you said, but he was also visiting the university of Arizona, which was his number one choice. And he took his visit and we fell, he fell in love with the campus. So he decided he's definitely going to the university of Arizona now. And oh, that's he's awesome. Study. So it was like a two for one kind, two birds, one stone kind of deal. That's great. Absolutely. Absolutely, man. So, you know, he's, he's going to start there in the fall and, and study music composition and business administration because he's a big music guy already tr trying to produce his own music and stuff. So I'm super proud of him. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. My kid just started, uh, well, it's his third year of, uh, T-ball, but he, uh, his opening day is tomorrow. So we'll see that, see how that goes. He's got a long way before where your son is, but who knows <laughs> uh, that can dream. We'll see what happens. Yeah. But yeah, but, but yeah, I'm super proud of, you know, yeah. So I'm still the pitching coach for the Ch Chatfield chargers awesome. <laughs> and, uh, yep. That's here in Littleton, Colorado. And you know, these boys, I'll tell you what, man, I've had a lot of fun, Mike. It's so much fun to kind of reinvigorates me and gives me that love of the game again too to, to be able to pass it along and help these kids out and stuff and we got a, just a great great bunch of kids man that I'm super proud of and like you said I mean we had two no hitters the first day and a double header it was unbelievable but we finished the trip four and one and we're five and three overall in the season but you know I think we got a chance to do something special this year 
Great. Good for you and, and nothing but the best. And I want to segue now to when you were a kid. I want to know how you got into the game of baseball. Was it was was baseball in your family's blood already or, or did you kind of break the mold when you when you decided to pursue it? How did you get into the game? It was definitely in my blood. My, my dad, uh, he's he's always like uh, kind of shy to admit like his athleticism and stuff, but he didn't go um, past high school and stuff. But his his uncle, you know, his brother, I mean, excuse me, my uncle, his brother would brag for him, you know, because he's like, right. Kenny, I'm telling you, man, if it wasn't for your dad, I wouldn't have gotten the varsity. His his brother was two years younger than him. So he told the coach he wasn't going to play unless his brother made the team, too. So my uncle affectionately says that, you know, thanks to your dad, I got to play some varsity baseball myself, too. So my dad was a pitcher shortstop, you know, and so it was in his blood. My dad grew up, you know, just loving the game. He was a Washington Senators fan and, you know, but but Mickey Mantle was his all-time favorite player and stuff, you know, and he just sure. loved the game and stuff. So he instilled that love in it for me. And he was the first, you know, the first person I ever played catch with in the backyard, you know, that, you know, that seeing that you would always see in the field of dreams and, you know, having to catch with your dad in the backyard, that's pretty much how I got started. And then I was fortunate enough that my dad was my coach from the time I was eight years old till about 14 years old. And he was, he was a really good mentor, man. And if it wasn't for my dad, you know, I, I wouldn't be where I am today. That's great. And I, I always kind of thought that, that, that baseball was always about fathers and sons. So that's great to hear that connection. Do you remember where you were when you first got the call to the big leagues that you were going to be a member of the 91 twins, which who went on to, to win uh, their second world championship in uh, five seasons that year? Yeah. Yeah. I was in Edmonton, Canada. Cause I was in the Pacific coast league for our triple a team. I was uh, with the, the Portland Beavers and um, Russ Nixon was our manager and he was an old school guy. He coached in the big leagues already at that point. And he was kind of like rough around the edges, you know, and, and, uh, was really tough on us young guys down there and stuff to push us to want us to be better and stuff. So he called me in the office and basically gave me that whole, like I'm in trouble type speech, you know, like, you know, oh, crap, what did I do? You know, I'm trying to think I didn't bust curfew last night. I was, you know, in bed by 10 and whatever. <laughs> and then so finally he's like, I'm just messing with you kid. You're going up to Minnesota and starting on Saturday. And I was like, I'm sorry, I'm what? <laughs> so it was a pretty cool thing. And the first thing I did too, Mike was there was, this is before cell phone. So, I had to go use a payphone, call, collect back to right. back to the United States in Maryland, and told my mom and dad. I was like, "Hey, you guys sitting down?" I said, "You know, what what are you guys doing this weekend?" And we're like, "I don't know. I mean, going to dinner with our friends, or whatever." I'm like, "Well, you're gonna have to cancel that because you're gonna have to get a flight to Minnesota to come watch me pitch." So it was a <laughs> pretty pretty cool experience to share that with my mom and dad. That is awesome, and it's not it's not an experience many can say. So good on you for being able to live that dream and, and get that call. Um, so the next year you you make your debut with the 91 twins and the next year you're on the, uh, the, the Pittsburgh pirates, a pretty good team, Barry Bonds, uh, Doug Drabeck, Andy Vance, like coached by Jim Leland. Uh, mm -hmm. it was an unhappy ending in the NLCS that year, uh, because you guys got defeated by your future team, the Braves. <laughs> but I want to talk about, uh, a little bit later in your tenure with the, with the pirates, because you made your first all-star team with them. And I want to kind of set the scene for the viewers because you had a pretty memorable uh, appearance because you came into the game in the sixth inning. You give up a double to Carlos Baerga of the Indians back then. But then you face Edgar Martinez. You get him to pop out to shallow center. I don't know if you remember all of this, but I'm going oh, yeah. to through it. Okay. And then you get uh, Mo Vaughn to strike out. And then you get Albert Bell, one of the greatest hitters in the game at the time, to ground out to shortstop. Now, those guys were probably the best hitters in the American League at that point in time. They all finished first, second, and third in the AL MVP voting that year. So my question to you is, what was it like to come into the game knowing you had to face them for your all-star debut? And was there a huge sense of relief once you got out of the inning unscathed? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, like you said, I remember Bayerga hit, I thought I threw a pretty decent pitch, as I recall, and he kind of just slapped it right down the first baseline, just inside the bag, you know, and I'm like, oh, come on, man. This is how I got to start my first all-star appearance. You know, I mean, to his credit, he went with the pitch and stuff, but, you know, it, it barely was inside the foul line. So he gets a double, and then what do they do? They pinch – I remember they pinch ran Roberto Alomar. So he, he pinch runs. He proceeds to steal third on, like, the second or third pitch. So now I have right. man on third, nobody out, you know, and I'm like – and now i got to face these guys, like the guys you just mentioned. So – you talk about nerve wracking. And at that point, if I, if I, as I recall, I think we were down two to one at that point. So, you know, I knew it was my job to keep us right there. And the last thing I want to do is I didn't want to give up any runs, but I figured at that point, to be honest with you, Mike, I'm like, if I can get out of this with just one run after having a man on third, nobody else, I'll be happy with that even. 
So when I got the first pop up, I remember I think I think I I can't remember if it was a fastball or change up. I don't remember the pitch, but that was a big sigh of relief right there to get him to sure. pop up, you know. And then then now you got Mo Vaughn, and at that point I just started throwing change ups to lefties because the old rule of thumb is you don't want to throw cha- the lefties shouldn't throw change ups to lefties because it goes down and into their power. Most right. power hitting lefties are good low ball hitters. Yep. So it was usually like a taboo thing. The lefties weren't supposed to do that. I just started doing that. It was one of the things that helped me have a better season that year. Sure. So as soon as I, I just wanted to get the two strikes to him, because I knew Mo Baum wouldn't be used to facing a left-handers changeup, got the two strikes to him, the changeup, he swung over it. And then from there, I fell behind on Albert Bell, but the same thing, I was not going to give in to him right there. And so 3-1, I just threw him a changeup, and he rolled over to short. And so, yeah, I mean, you talk about like, whew, man, the butterflies, everything, the emotions yeah. just running through me. I'm like, I can't believe I just got out of that, you know, and stuff. And then, and then uh, Jeff Conine comes up and hits a, a you know, tying home run the, at the right. top of the next inning and stuff. And it was made me feel really good because Felipe Lou afterwards uh, kind of acknowledged me from the team too, saying that, you know, hey man, that, that inning by Nagel kind of really helped turn the tide for us because to get out of that inning, I felt like it was a momentum shift for us and, you know, it helped the National League win that game again. Right. Awesome. Been few and far very- between since then for the National League. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They had a run in the mid nineties where I think they beat the uh, American League four straight. And then as I got a little older and, and watched the games, it was always the American League who won. American League has dominated the last 25 years. Yeah. Dominated. Unbelievable. So the next year, you stay in the National League the next year, you come to the uh the Braves midseason, and uh they're riding high. And uh, a couple years later, you you, you know, you join the pitching staff. You know, that includes Greg Maddox, John Smoltz, Tom Glavin, the whole nine yards. A couple years later, you're part of a pitching staff in 1998. You're part of a pitching staff that many people considered to be the best ever. It was Maddox, Glavin, Smoltz, you, and Kevin Millwood. All of you had earned at least 16 wins that season. I don't know if you know this, but that hadn't been done by five different pitchers for the same team since the 1923 Yankees. I don't think it's ever going to be done again. I don't think pitchers go that deep into games to get as many wins. It could happen. I don't think it's going to. Um, But what was it like to be a part of that historic rotation? I'll tell you, man, you know, a lot lot of people always ask me, like, you know, did you feel more pressure pitching in rotation with guys like that? Especially, uh, as you mentioned, three future Hall of Famers. You know, you knew at that point those guys were well on their way to making the Hall of Fame as long as they had stayed healthy at that point. And, you know, I always told them, I said, you know, look, nobody puts more pressure on myself than me. You know, I'm going to be my own worst critic and everything. And. The best way I used to say, Mike, was I said, look, I, I, I compared it to this. If you run in a race, like let's say a 100-yard dash, right, you're a sprinter or whatever, and if you're running against guys that three or four or five other guys that you know you beat, you beat them every time, you're probably going to win the race again, but you're, you're not going to run your best times because you're not going to be pushed. You know, now, now on the flip side, you're running against guys that are just as fast, if not faster. You might not win that race, but you're probably going to set your best times in that race. That's how I felt pitching the rotation with those guys. You know, I might not win that have the hardware, the Cy Youngs like them and everything, but they elevated my game to another level. And even more importantly, I felt like I had the best seat in the house, you know, on a daily basis, being able to watch them go to work and do their thing. If you couldn't learn something from watching those guys and picking their brains, you know, I mean, there's something wrong with you. And, and basically, like, I felt like I didn't want to be the low man on the totem pole. So I watched Maddox go throw a 79 pitch complete game. Glavin get, you know, 15 ground ball out, small strike out 12. When it was my turn, I'm like, you know, I, I'm going to go do my thing now, man, because, you know, I got to compete with these guys. So, you know, in Millwood, I, would, I, I guarantee you would tell you the same thing. So we just fed off each other. We pushed each other. And that's what made that rotation, I think, that, that good was we were able to feed off each other that way. That's awesome. That's really cool. And after the, uh, you know, unfortunately, you know, the Braves were a great team in the 90s. They won five pennants. They only, they only won one World Series. I think they were a lot better than that. Yankees are You'll hear people say that the Yankees are the team of the 90s. I still think it's the Braves. They won five pennants. They had the most wins. And, uh, you know, I'm a New York guy. I, I'm more of a Yankees fan than a Braves fan. But objectively, I will say that I think the Braves were the team of the 90s. Um, so after the Braves, you go to the Reds for a little while. And then in the middle of the year 2000, you get, uh, I think you get traded to the Yankees. And um, I want to jump ahead to the World Series that year because you were the starting pitcher in game four. Now. Joe Torre gives you the ball. You're in the fifth inning. You're in line for the win. You're pitching well. Um, Mike Piazza's coming to the plate. Uh, Torre comes out of the dugout, and he wants to relieve you with David Cohn. Um, I thought it was kind of a dubious call. I know you had given up a, a home run to Piazza earlier that game, but you had also struck him out. You were only at 
73 pitches, which back then was absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, what was what what did Joe Torre? What was his reasoning for taking you out that game? Because again, to the to the average viewer, it looked like a little bit of a of a strange skeptical call for him to make. What what did he say to you? Well, to be honest with you, Mike, he didn't really say anything to me when he when he came out to get the ball, and and I didn't even know I had you know I I got a second out. It was I remember it was two fly two weak fly balls to right field. You know the first two outs, and as Torrey recalled, it was two deep fly balls. You know, so he was worried about that. And, and what he told the press was, you know, because Piazza had taken me deep earlier in the game too, you know, he was worried about me facing him again. Now, again, you know, I felt like I deserved that right to stay in there. You know, I'm winning the game. Absolutely. You know, I felt like I had the game in hand. You know, if there anything, I felt like if anything, he could have come out and said, hey, why don't we do this? The old unintentional, intentional walk. Just be careful. Don't give Piazza anything to hit. He's pretty much the only guy in the lineup that might hurt you right now, the way I've been pitching and stuff. But, you know, it was literally I, I was walking around the mound rubbing the ball and then and, and I didn't see him do the thing to the bullpen. Right, you know, right. I, I never saw it. So when he holds his hand out to give me the ball type thing and I was like, wait, you're taking me out? He's yeah. like, yeah, yeah. Hey, you did a great job. You know, did a great job. Right. So I handed the ball and I was honestly, Mike, I was just more confused and perplexed and everything, you know. And then afterwards, I know Tori had said, you know, he wanted to give Cohn one more chance to get in there also too. David Cohn was his boy. I, I understood that. I love David Cohn, one of my favorite yeah. people in the game. You know, Likewise, one of my favorite of teammates. My yeah, he's, he's unbelievable. You know, so to be honest with you, Mike, I haven't shared this with other than people, my friends and family, but I'll be honest with you. And I'll tell you pretty much, I think, why that whole situation happened. After I pitched in the ALCS, I started game one and game five because of what happened in the ALDS. And we were, you know, the way the rotation shake shook out, we ended up going five games, which you, we didn't think we would. So I was kind of the emergency starter for game one, you know, yeah. up. I'll be the first to tell you, you know, it should have been Clemens or whoever it was, you know, Pettit, whoever. But the way the rotation shook, shook out in that first round, I ended up starting game one and game five. I felt like I did my job in those games. I held us in the game. I was facing uh, Freddie Garcia, who was just on fire that postseason. I mean, right. he had our number. And so the game five, I, I ended up walking, I think, two guys. One one was A-Rod, who I pitched around on purpose because he had hit one off the facade at Yankee Stadium against me. That yeah. Dag on near knocked the stadium back a couple of feet off me, you know, whatever. <laughs> so it was one of those, you know, it's the Greg Maddox series. He's like, look, you always have one guy in the lineup that's not going to let you, you can't let him beat you. So if you pitch around him, that's fine. So I made up my mind I was going to pitch around A-Rod. And then I walked Ricky Henderson on like a, or, or I'm sorry, I, well, I did walk three guys. Ricky Henderson and Edgar Martinez, I walked both of them. They both ended up being like, 10, 11 pitch hit bats where they fouled off a bunch of pitches and they, they beat me on, you know, and, they, and I went walking on a marginal pitch. Fast forward to on a, our a workout day before the World Series started, I come back from the shower and I have like 30 New York media members around my locker. I'm like, what are you guys doing? I'm not starting until game four. And they're like, well, that's what we're here to talk to you about, Denny. Uh, you know, according to Joe, he might not start you now. He might start Tony, you know, game four. And I said, well, hey, if he starts Cohen, you know, I mean, my gosh, look at his track record. The number, his career numbers in the World Series, he had like a 1.6 ERA. So I yeah. said, look, if Coney starts, he deserves it, you know. Well, you know, Joe said he, the reason why is because he felt you were too tentative in that game five start, you know, whatever. <laughs> and, and you and you, you walked too many guys and he didn't like your control. And I said, I'm sure you probably took him out of context. And, and literally like two or three reporters flipped their notepads back, you know, and said, nope, Joe says right here, you know, Nagel was too tentative in that game five start. And I said, well, look. I know what I did. And I pitched around A-Rod. Yes, I walked in. The other two guys, they worked. You guys saw the game. You know, I felt like I did my job. I went right after them. I left down two to one and a couple of my runs came in. But I did my job. And I'll st- I'll, I'm sorry, I'll stick I'll stick to that. They they went back and told Joe that I said that. And next thing I know, Joe was cornering me by the showers the next day. And he's like, hey, Denny, you know, anytime you, he, Joe is big on keeping things out of the media. If, you have an, if we have an issue, let's handle it behind closed doors. Right. So that's what he proceeds to tell me. I said, Joe, that's fine, but you're the one who started it, you know, and stuff. You said this, and I was just defending myself. You know, they put me on the spot. All I said was, and, and, and honestly, Mike, I said, Joe, all I said was, I, you know, maybe you took Joe out of context. They reread your coach back, and I said, well, I, I respectively disagree. I felt like I did my job. So I think he didn't like that, Mike, to be honest with you, you know, and stuff. And, you know, it was just one of those things. And He'll tell you that, you know, he, he did it to, to get Coney that outing. And I have no problem with that. Like I said, right. Coney's yep. my boy, man. If that's what it was and stuff, I think there was a little bit of that thing there, you know, and stuff that he was mad at me because I suppose he went behind his back. But, you know, I mean, he did it first to me and stuff, you know, but it's a, it was a stupid tit for tat thing and stuff, you know. I don't hold any ill feelings towards it now or anything like that. 
it, it was just that, you know, when I told my family, when everybody was just kind of perplexed also too, going, why did he pull you? You know, I mean, I didn't have an answer. And the, the, the second part of that real quick, the funny story to that. Sure. Shea Stadium was an old stadium, you know. I mean, yeah. the pipe, the pipes were bad, the locker rooms oh, were yeah. bad, everything. It just so happened a pipe burst in the training back behind the training room area and it flooded like the training room area and other parts of, of the locker room. Yeah. So now the story starts going around the New York press that Nagel was so ticked off that he took a bat to like the pipes back there, burst the pipe, you know, flooded <laughs> the training room and all this stuff. I'm like, good gosh, you guys will run with anything, man. You know, man, and, yeah, and so the New York media it, will eat you alive, you know. So, oh, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, you know, I watched that, you know, there's a, if you go back and watch the, the footage of the game, you know, there's a close up of your face and, and there's perplexity all over it. You didn't understand yeah. why it was happening. You know, David Cohn, it was a nice redemption moment for David Cohn because he had a, he had a really bad year that year. And that was, mm -hmm. I think, his only appearance in the World Series. Um, so it was a nice redemption moment when he got Piazza, I think, to pop out to second. But uh, nonetheless, yep. it was still kind of a questionable one. And I, I think yep. he surely could have kept going, especially only at 73 pitches. Yeah. And, and, you know, honestly, Mike, the other thing was, too, you know, I had a tra I felt like I had a track record in the postseason at that point, too. I pitched some yeah. big games with the Braves. You know, I threw a four-hit shutout in 97 in game four when we were down two games to one. And, you know, because I always, you know, I always lived for those moments. I didn't feel like sure. I ever let those moments get to me and stuff. So I felt like I had earned it, too. And that's why I felt like it was a little bit of slap in the face, you know. But, but you know, if it had been Bobby Cox, it wouldn't happen because Bobby knew me. So just as my exactly. first half season with the Yankees, too. And Joe didn't really know my personality that well and stuff at that point and everything. So, you know, look, the way I look at it, man. It's, you know, it's no big deal anymore. I'm, I'm, I've been over it for years. I got yeah. a World Series ring out of it, man. There's nothing I got no complaints. That's all you can do, man. There's, like you said, there's nothing you can do about it. So you just move on. It is what it was. But you did win the World Series that year, you with the, the rest of the team. You had a couple of close calls with the World Series. 92 and LCS, you were close, but you had that sad ending where the Braves beat you. Um, and then 91, even before that, I think you were part of the team, but not actually part of the world series roster so this was the first this was the first team that you were uh, that you won the world championship while you were part of the roster what was it like to finally to get a ring and, and be a part of the world series roster it was pretty special man because you know as you know it was the subway series so to be able to play the whole series in new york you know playing against the mets because obviously normally as everybody knows you know you play two games at your place and then you fly out to the west coast or wherever it might be Right. Played the other games there. My family, being from the Maryland area, they were able to take the train up and spend the whole week, you know, in, in, in New York to watch the whole World Series. So that was special in itself to have my whole family there for the whole time. And then I remember Billy Crystal was there filming, getting background scenes for the movie 61 that was getting ready to come sure. out on with the Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle chase. And uh, so he was there constantly with his film crew and stuff. So I remember when we won and clinched after game five, my whole family's on the field and you know, they're like, God, can we meet Billy Crystal? So I'm like, Billy, this is my mom, this is my aunt, this is my uncle, this is my cousin. And finally, Billy Crystal goes, holy crap, how many Nagels are there, man? <laughs> so, so that, that was great. fun, you know. And then obviously, Mike, I mean, then the, the, there's nothing like a ticker tape parade in New York City. I mean, that was incredible to have that. I remember another funny thing. We're, we're going down, you know, Broadway, whichever street it was. And, and I'm sitting there soaking all in. I got my camera, you know, and stuff. And I thought my wife at the time, I thought she was standing next to me. I got my arm around, which I think is her, and I'm kind of holding her tight, squeezing her and stuff, you know. And oh boy. finally, finally, I look, and I'm like, "Oh my God, it's it's uh, Roger Clemens' wife," you know. Oh. And, and <laughs> Roger and my wife had stepped back because they realized what was happening, you know. I just thought it was Jen, my wife, was next to me, so they're both cracking up, you know. And even Roger's wife, I think Debbie, um, yeah. she she was next to me too, and she's she's laughing because you know they're just waiting for me to notice. And I'm like, "Oh right. my God, I'm so sorry." <laughs> That was a little funny moment there. In the it's a celebration. Here, so. You just grab the closest person anyway. <laughs> but I, I want to say that that 61, that's, it's funny that you bring that up. It's probably my favorite uh, non-fictional baseball movie out there. I mean, that was so well done. Well, so I well done. The old Tiger Stadium to do some CGI magic with the, you know, yes. the, some of the Yankee Stadium scenes. It was, it was a well done movie for, for an HBO movie. So that was, that's cool that you kind of got to be a part of that and, and meet. Definitely. Them. Well, Absolutely. So you played for a bunch of managers over over your career, and a lot of them were were pretty legendary managers. You had Tom Kelly, very respected guy in Minnesota. Then you had Jim Leland, who I wouldn't be surprised if he makes the Hall of Fame one day. He won yeah. the Marlins in 97. Obviously, Bobby Cox, and, and for a very short period of time, Joe Torre. Is there a um, is there a manager who you click with or was your favorite as you were playing for them? I know you played with some more than others, but do you have a favorite? 
Yeah, I mean, with all due respect to all those guys, you know, because like you said, I, I mean, I was fortunate enough to play for some unbelievable guys, but there was something about Bobby Cox, man, that just clicked with all of us. You know, you see it when, whenever they praise, like, unfortunately, Bobby's been struggling with some health issues. He had a major stroke a couple of years ago and stuff, you know, and he still hasn't really recovered from that and everything as far as I know. And But before that, you know, even when, when they retired his number and stuff, you know, anytime there was something that, that the Braves held for him, you saw it. I mean, every single guy came back to honor him, you know, in, in Atlanta for that for that celebration and stuff, because there's a reason. I mean, you know, so many managers usually had that saying that, hey, my door's always open. You know, if you, yeah. if you need to come and talk about it. Bobby really personified that, man. I mean, it was yeah. just he, he was a he was a father figure to a lot of us guys at, towards the end of his career. He almost became like a grandfather figure to some of those young yeah. kids you know, that were coming up and stuff. But he, he was just unbelievable, Mike. I mean, he. There was a reason why Bobby, you know, led led the league every year and getting kicked out of games. It was because he fought that hard for his players. If he felt like his hitters were getting screwed on the strike calls, you know, or vice versa, if he felt like his pitchers weren't getting the strikes, you know, that we that we deserved and stuff. I mean, that's why he got kicked out. There was a purpose to it because he wanted us to know, and we did know that he had our back no matter right. what. And the other thing too, Mike, was that if anything ever happened, you know, like anything on the field, if a player did something, whatever. Bobby always handled that behind closed door. I mean, always, you know, the media never knew about it. And if they did catch wind of it and they tried to go talk to a player about such and such that this incident happened, Bobby would call them in there and ring the media out and say, Hey, don't you dare go try to talk to him. That's between me and him. And he knows that if I hear of any of you guys going to talk to them, you know, I'm going to revoke your pass for a couple of days or something. Oh, that's you know, awesome that's, that he had your back that much. Awesome. It's too bad that nowadays, if he were uh, managing, he wouldn't be getting thrown out as much with all this instant replay that, we had. It's almost, <laughs> it makes you makes you dislike instant replay because you can't have a Bobby Cox anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. But so he was your favorite manager. Any favorite teammates? Anybody you're still buddies with today that you played with? Yeah, you know, it's, once again, it seems like the Braves. Uh, you know, even though it wasn't my longest tenure, it was the Pirates. But for for some reason, you know, again, well, not for some reason, because again, I think, you know, because of Bobby, because of how that organization was, we really did feel so much like a family. So. The, and then I've, I've done the, the – I've coached for nine, eight out of the last nine years now in the Braves Fantasy Camp, you know, down in January, either at Orlando and now the, the new place there, the Cooler Day Park, you know, in Northport. But uh, so Glavin, Smoltz, Maddox, not as much. Maddox is always doing something else forever. But I definitely keep in touch with uh, Steve Avery. He's one of my best friends. Yeah, he uh, was another great pitcher in the early – Oh, the, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So between, between him, Glavin, Smoltz, and then, uh, and then a couple like Chipper, I definitely keep in touch with Chipper. Chipper's been great, man. I mean, anytime I need some ball sign, like even just a couple months ago, we had a charity event for the high school team that I'm coaching. And, you know, all I have to do is shoot Chipper a text, you know, and he's like, send him out and eggs. I'll sign him and get him back to you, buddy. That's you awesome. Know, so it's just all those guys I've been able to really stay in touch with. And I love to hear when players don't get full of themselves. You know, they, they give back. They, you know, they, they're, they're, they don't let their ego get the best. And that's really great to hear, especially for a guy like Chipper Jones. Happy to hear Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Yeah, so – I want to talk a little bit now about uh, today's game. Um, over the last mm -hmm. 10 years or so, it's been a complete renovation in terms of all these new rules. I think when you were playing, the only big ones were the wild card team and uh, interleague play, I would say, were the big two when you played. Yep. Um, but now, you know, especially this season, you've got bigger bases, you've got the shift ban, and one that would have pertained to you the most, which is the pitch clock. <laughs> now, do you think the pitch clock, I mean, it might help the game, but what can it do to a pitcher's mindset i mean a pitcher is told his whole life there's no clock on this thing you take your time um could it could it affect a pitcher's rhythm and and allow him to not throw effectively do you think you would have benefited or, or been you know seriously mentally hurt by a clock if you had to pitch with one it wouldn't have hurt me at all mike because uh you know i i always took pride in working fast anyways you know because i always felt like I learned from a younger age, you know, in high school and college and everything too. I was, I was blessed with having great, a great high school baseball coach and a great college coach too at the University of Minnesota. And one thing that was instilled in me was try to work, you know, don't work so fast that you're, you know, that all of a sudden you're throwing a pitch you don't want to throw and that kind of right. stuff. But the quicker you're able to get on that mound and make up your mind, throw the pitch, you keep your defense on their toes and they want to make those plays for you more. You know, there's, you know, I played with some guys that were the human rain delays, you know, out there on the mound and oh, stuff. Yeah. And, yep. and you really can see the, the effect that it does have on the defensive guys playing behind you. You know, guys are just like, holy cow, man, throw the ball, man. You know, you just want to play some defense behind you. So it wouldn't affect me at all. But I certainly definitely, you know, with those guys that I mentioned that were the slower working guys that were the human rain delay guys. You know, I mean, I know there's a few of me, you know, that have 
in the big leagues now. I can't remember the one guy. God, just watching him a couple years ago, and I'm like, oh crap, this guy's definitely going to struggle with that pitch clock if they ever yeah. do enforce it. So I can't remember which guy it was. Um, God, yeah, I, was I remember hearing about it. I don't know. Uh, I forget his name too. So yeah, better with players from your era than today's era, but yeah. Oh yeah, you know there was definitely a couple of guys. I mean, like Rick Rick Sutcliffe was so s- slow yeah. moving on the mound and stuff. You know, yeah. it might have affected him for sure. And in the you batter's know, but, box, you had Mike Hargrove, who was even before you played. Yeah. Oh, my batter. gosh. Yep, yeah. Hargrove, you know, and my, my boy Sean Casey, man, because Casey, yeah. Casey had he did, he had all those little things with his, you know, yeah. <laughs> the gloves and everything, and he would tap, and then he would tap his feet and everything yeah. and stuff. Nomar Garcia Parra wouldn't be able to survive in today's game. Forget exactly. It. Nomar had the same thing as Sean had, yep. So. But it's good. As of this interview today, it's going to air next week, but as of this interview, it's opening day right now, and I'm watching – I'm watching the Yankees game and, you know, I, I didn't know what to, what I, I didn't really watch any spring training games. and I didn't know what to make of, of what the pitch clock was going to be like. I have to say, it's not one of the worst changes. It is keeping the game going. The, the, the pitcher's rhythms don't seem to be thrown off too much. So we'll see how it plays out over the course of the season. But uh, I wanted to get your take on that because you were a pitcher. And it's one the, of the big the, I will say, Mike, the only thing I will say, you know, but yeah, as far as like, it wouldn't affect me. And I don't think, like you said, I don't think it's going to affect too many rhythms and stuff, whatever. The only thing that's really going to stink is the first time it happens in the, one of these big situations where it's seventh, eighth inning, teams down by one or up by one, and you know, and and the pitchcock gets called with the bases loaded, yeah, three two or three one count, you know, and that's how the run comes that's in how and tied up. End, right? That's where it's going to be like, Ugh, you know, the, the old school. The pe- and the penalties for violating the clock don't sit right with me, like you know, and if uh, if a batter if a batter takes too long getting into the box then the pitcher is awarded a strike. So that means he can have a strikeout having only thrown two pitches. It just doesn't, yeah. it, it just kind of negates the rules of baseball a little bit. And that's where it doesn't sit right. But if it speeds up the game of play, I can certainly see why that's a positive. Um, are there any changes over the last 10 years? I say the last 10 years, because that's probably when the, the most changes in my lifetime have happened uh, that you think are bad for the game or detrimental to the game or just uh, shouldn't have happened. I, th- you know, uh, th- this, the shift thing, like out, out, out low on the shift or whatever. I, I think that's just a joke. I really do. Yeah. Because, yeah, because you be allowed to strategize. F- right. And for, for two reasons, exactly. Strategize. And to me, it's just amazing to me to watch some of these hitters continue to hit into the shift because can you imagine Wade Boggs and Tony Gwynn and, you know, I mean, Rod Carew, right. guys like, you know, could just control the field and, and flip the ball wherever they wanted to. But honestly, Mike, I mean, I'll take it a step farther, too. I'm so Another guy I play with, Larry Walker, you yep. know, a power hitter that you would think would be victim to that, that would hit. Larry would have laid down so many bunts, you know, whatever, to that Why left not? side, you know. He would he would have bunted doubles and triples, man, with the way that guy could run the bases, yep. you know, and stuff, whatever. So it's just frustrating to know that they had to do this because, you know, because guys weren't making that adjustment. Right. And they felt exactly. like, you know, it's hurting the game and stuff, whatever. So I'm just like, man, I just can't understand that, how guys – with this new new age of baseball with the, the launch angles and, you know, and everything else. And these guys just not be able to make adjustments up. That's frustrating for me to watch. You know, I just well, can't yeah, understand In that. essence, it's enabling is what it is. You know, you, you would think yep. as a major league hitter, you know, hit one down the line, bunt one down the line. Um, and, and then one other, one other one I will say, Mike, too, is that I've, I've kind of considered myself a National League guy because I pretty sure. much suppose, spent most of my, my time in the National League. I love to swing it. I love, you know, I had five home runs in my career too, you know, yeah. stuff. So I took pride in being able to handle the bat as a pitcher, but also too, I mean, I just like the difference of style of play with the national league, you know, and the fact that you had to take into consideration that, okay, the pitcher spots coming up, yep. you know, next inning, do we pull him? Do we pull him after five, even though he's pitching good, it's only two to one ball game. You know, there's a lot of strategy involved. I get it, Mike. I do. I, I totally understand that it's prolonged other guys' careers, you know, whatever that now they can also go to the national league. If right. they just can't play in the field anymore, someone like Albert Pujols comes to mind, you know, who was able to play for St. Louis and be able to DH and stuff. Yep. I think that's great, sure. you know, but, but man, I don't know. I'm just, I hate that there's, that there's no difference between the two leagues. now. I get it. It's like, what's the point in having two leagues? I mean, there's gotta be yep. some difference. And now that doesn't seem to be a difference anymore. Um, how about any players or, or teams to watch for this year? Do you think there are going to be any teams that, are going to make the playoffs. I want to mention that your Braves are, uh, and I didn't realize this until I did uh, research uh, for this interview, that they have, uh, they're riding five straight division title wins. Any chance they reach 14 uh, like they did back in the 90s and 2000s? And uh, would, are there any players that you think are, are worth looking at this year or keeping an eye on? 
I mean, I, I would I would love to say yes if that's possible. I don't think that's possible anymore. Yeah, I mean, I, because I you know, so. man. I had oh, to ask. Though. I mean, the fact they've won five in a row now has been pretty incredible, and I think yeah. that says a lot to Snicker, man. I mean, Snickers is he's cut out the same Bobby Cox mold, same exact thing. The players love playing for him. I mean, you can't have a better guy right now to lead that team. He's like I said, the players. It, there's something to be said when you have a manager that the players are willing to go out there and, and lay it on the line for you, night in and night out, and that's how yeah. Snicker is. And so. You know, that's, that's a big reason why. Um, but, you know, I, I think it, it, you'd be hard-pressed to not say watch out for the Padres this year, the way that team is loaded with offensive-wise. And, and they've got some great young arms and stuff, too. You know, as always, it's going to come down to pitching. Um, you know, to be honest with you, uh, as much as this pains me to say, too, because they were always our rival, and as you know, in, in New York, too, playing for the Yankees, and, you know, you're supposed to hate the Mets and everything. Yeah, I wouldn't mind. I wouldn't mind seeing the Mets win this year. I really wouldn't. I, if for anything else, to be honest with you, Mike, because I'm a big fan of Buck Showalter. I love yeah. the way that guy oh, manages. Me too. Yep. You know, and I think he's never had enough credit, man. You look at his track record everywhere he's been. The Yankees, the Yankees were able to be that team of the late '90s and early 2000s because of he he put that team in place. Then he yep. goes to Arizona. He put that team in place. Right. They let him go. The next year, Bob Brenly wins the World Series. You know, mm -hmm. he, he put a great team together in Texas. You know, when they started making the playoffs right after he left. Right. So I'd love – in Baltimore. And then he goes to Baltimore, and that – you know, I mean, he did an incredible job there too, and I grew up an Orioles fan. You know, I grew yeah. up outside of Baltimore, so I was a big fan of him then and stuff, you know. And I think it's been it's been fun to watch him kind of progress as a manager too because he was known as kind of like the really hard, you know, chiseled guy and stuff that was really tough on his players when he was younger. And he's kind of softened up and really been able to kind of sit back and really enjoy himself even more too. So, you yeah. know, just like Dusty Baker last year, to be able to watch him finally win, oh, win a World so Series. Oh, see him finally I, do it. I think yeah. Buck Showalter would be another great story this year as well, too. That's a great point. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm, a, I'm actually a big Mets fan myself. They haven't won since the year I was born in 86. So <laughs> hopefully <laughs> something will change this year if they don't do anything too Metsy. You know, it's always something. Edwin Diaz is already out. So we'll see what uh, happens. But uh, nonetheless, they have a good-looking team this year. Yeah. So. Um, so what have you, uh, last question, what have you been up to the last, uh, 20 years? I know you're, you know, you, it's been almost 20 years since you've thrown a major league pitch and I know you're coaching, but what has the journey been like, uh, since you last threw your, uh, since you last threw a pitch in, uh, 2003 coming up on 20 years ago? Yeah. You know, I mean, I, honestly, Mike, I mean, I feel like I've been, you know, not only was I blessed to be able to play a kid's game for a living, you know, and, and make crazy amount of money doing it, you know, never in a million years would I have thought that would have happened. And then the second part, the second chapter of my life, you know, that I've been so blessed in the fact that I was able to make that kind of money that I could be a stay at home dad. And, sure. you know, unfortunately, my, my marriage didn't work out. I ended up getting divorced and stuff. So I was a single parent for, for the longest time here. I still am. And my kids are 23 and 18 year old boy and girl twins now. But because of the fact that I retired at a young age, I was able to be that dad that went on all the field trips with them, you That's know, right. to be able to do all the parent fun, you know, stuff with them at school coach whatever the kids were playing at you know in, in particular years and stuff and you know, I used to feel bad sometimes because some of their friends would say man I wish my dad could come on field trips yeah. like this and stuff too yeah. and I you know I tell them trust me your dad would love to be here too man I'm just lucky enough that I can be able to do this for them right now so I honestly Mike to be honest with you I spent the the big chunk of my years when I was done playing just doing that fun dad stuff you know coaching whatever sports it was parent volunteers at school you know whatever it was helping out you know with any kind of things at school and stuff you know volunteering wherever I could and stuff and I almost took a job in 2010. The um, uh, color analyst was was open for the Washington Nationals. Oh, cool. um, okay. I think it was Rob, Rob Dibble had gotten fired or something yep. at that point, and it came down to me and FP Santangelo. And uh, FP kind of had a little inside track. John Miller, he was working for the Giants at the time, doing on field stuff and everything. And so John Miller gave him a good good uh, review right. and stuff, you know, for the Nats and. So, you know, to be honest with you, Mike, everything happens for a reason. And it was one of those jobs that I'm actually glad I didn't get because Absolutely. at that point, my kids were 10 and, and five years old. The twins yeah. were five. And as you know, I mean, if I had started covering the team on TV, I would have had to do as much traveling as I did playing Absolutely. stuff, too. So I wouldn't have been able to do all that fun dad stuff then. No, you're doing it right, my friend. And, uh, you know, being a dad is, is more important in the long run than, than being a player. So good on you for for being a part of your son's team and and uh, doing it the right way. Um Thanks so much for doing this. Um, I, you know, I can't tell you how much it means, but uh, you know, we'll stay in touch. And and you have a great game tonight. I know you your uh, your son has a game tonight, right? You guys are uh, playing. Yep, yep. We won. We played last night and uh, had a good game. We won eleven to four, and now we're playing a really tough team tonight. That's uh, like in the top ten in the state. So hopefully, we'll awesome. pull this one out too.
Awesome. And it's awesome to hear that he is uh, continuing the baseball legacy. So I don't know why that just happened. <laughs> there. there we go. Okay. There we that go. might just be my uh, connection. But anyway, uh, I guess that's a sign to wrap it up. So thanks so much for doing this. Good luck in the game. I'm so happy to hear your story. And uh, we'll stay in touch, my friend. Thanks so much, Denny. You got it, Mike. Pleasure, man. You take care. Bye-bye. All right, buddy.